The Ray Hanania Show is brought to you by the U.S. Arab Radio Network and sponsored by Arab News Newspaper, the Middle East's leading English language publication with print and online editions in Saudi Arabia, Dubai, France, Japan, Pakistan, England, and the United States. Listen to live radio every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern in Detroit, Washington, D.C., New York, and Ontario, Canada. Or watch the live broadcast on Facebook.com forward slash Arab News. The Ray Hanania Show is rebroadcast in Chicago at 12 noon on Thursday. For more information on the radio stations, live Facebook broadcast, and podcasts, visit ArabNews.com. And now, here's your host, columnist and U.S. special correspondent for Arab News, Ray Hanania. And it's Wednesday, August 31st, 2022, and I am your host, Ray Hanania. We're broadcasting live in Detroit, Washington, D.C., and rebroadcasting on Thursday in Chicago at 12 noon on WNWI AM 1080 Radio. Today, we're going to be looking at two issues. In segment one, we'll be talking with Rowan Redwan, the Arab News editor and writer on the growing film industry in Saudi Arabia and the increasing role of women in that industry. And we also will have an interview with guest filmmaker, Danielle Al Hamrani, who is uh, the CCO of Ed Gantz Dancer Productions, a filmmaking company based in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Later, after the break at the bottom of the hour, we will be talking with Charles Lister, who is a senior fellow and the director of the Syria and Countering Terrorism and Extremism programs at the Middle East Institute, who's going to give us some insight on what's happening in Syria. Uh, We're with Rowan Redwan, the deputy section's head and regional correspondent for Arab News, who this past week wrote a fascinating story on the uh, growing film industry in Saudi Arabia and the world and the inclusion of Arab women in that. And oftentimes when we hear about movies, we only see men. But her article that she wrote uh, August 25th, it's titled, Is Arab Filmmaking Really Male Dominated? Mm -hmm. Um, But tell us about what kind of filmmaking is being done at what level and some of the people that you interviewed for your story. What did you find out? Well, first of all, it's a very, very fascinating topic because people in the West don't really correlate the relation. We don't have a relationship between, they don't, can't really connect the relationship between filmmaking, females, they always have this stereotype in their heads. You know, there's always a stereotype that, oh, women are always like the actresses, you know, they're the pretty ones, they're the pretty face, when actually not really. There are more women behind the cameras than than they'd expect. So there was a study conducted by the Doha Film Institute um, that actually mentioned that 26% of women, of, of directors are we are female here in the Arab world. And they did a comparison study and they found that only 8% in the US are female directors. Wow. That's a, that's a number that, and you would think that, you know, the film industry in the US and Hollywood and in Europe would be more advanced and have more inclusion. They'd include more women and, you know, even in the awards, not really. So the, the stereotype, in other words, that women are oppressed in the Middle East and they have freedom here in the United States. Uh, when you look at the film industry, it kind of suggests that's turned upside down on its head. Sounds like true. women Very have true. more freedom to produce movies and films in the Middle East. You said only 8% here in the United in the West or the United 8% States? 8% in the United States, only 8%. That's terrible. I'm going to be yelling at people when I <laughs> talk to my friends because it should be more. And, I, I, uh, I do hope so. I mean, sorry to cut you off, but I spoke to a film critic as well. He mentioned something that's very interesting. He said that there are more Arab female directors in um, applying for, um, not applying, excuse me, um, fi- submitting their films, their independent films at the Cannes Film Festival this year than women in Europe, than European wow. female directors. That's got to tell you something, right? Do we know how many more there are? Did he give you any details on that? Or is Not it just really. a larger number? And he just mentioned that he's a, it's a larger number. I mean, that's, he's a curator. He, he selects these movies. You know, he knows a lot about film. 
that that has to tell you something that there is a lot more room here to conduct to create films as a director or producer or whatnot than it is in the West and Europe. Um, that just shows, I think, also that there is a level of freedom with each country. Of course, Saudi Arabia, for example, here is more is different than it is in in, in than than Tunisia or Morocco. And I think it's more about the cultural makeup, the, how the cultural is, you know, the culture, the traditions are stitched together and, you know, their circumstances are different than they are here. Each country has its own unique signature. So I think women are the best people out there to tell a story. I mean, with all due respect, but, you know. That's okay. <laughs> I, I think it's great. And um, the interesting thing, I want to go back on my observation that maybe there's a a bias against women. Maybe do you think it's possibly that the U.S. Um, and, and we're talking generally, not specifically, but maybe there's a bias against the Arab world. In other words, that Arab women, you know, they're only eight percent, you know, actually, and that's in the U.S. and more in the Middle East. I wonder if the topic is the restrictive factor. Did you come across that at all, or? Well, I don't think that it's just that they think that we're oppressed. They just don't think that we have the skill sets, that women here have the skill sets when it's not really true. I mean, I spoke to a friend of mine who worked at, who, who, who works generally, usually at uh, international film festivals. She went to uh, a film school in Lebanon, in Beirut. And she said while she was in school, 28 members, okay, 28 classmates of hers are female where he's, two male members are in the class. So the whole major, so the whole year, she only had two males in her classes. Whereas wow. you had 28%, 28, excuse me, 28 other pupils are female. So you would, th you would think that it would, it would be the opposite since we, since the West portrays film industry, the film industry here in the Arab world as male dominated, but quite the contrary. And do they, do you know if they produce these, uh, the Middle East films, do they do them in English and Arabic? Um, and I wonder, is the language a barrier? Did you talk to any of the uh, female producers in terms of, you know, was that a factor in, in, in how their film was being accepted outside really. of uh, the Middle East? Not really. They have translations. They have, um, you know, most of their films, um, most of the people I spoke to, some were on record, some were off record, were all adamant to keep with the the language of the land. You know, they they want to keep it authentic. They want the identity to show. And uh, one of that is the language, the accent, the dialect. So if you have an actor who comes from the central region of Nejd, for example, they'd have the Nejdi dialect, where you have, for example, in Morocco, They'd speak French, English, French, uh, Arabic, for example. Um, they keep to the, they want their identity to show as much as possible. They want the story to be shown. They want, you know, the circumstances of, um, I don't know, like the slums of Rabat or, or you know, uh, Cairo, for example, Southern or Central Cairo, for example. They want that real authentic feel. And they use the language just normally as if every, like, as if it's an everyday spoken thing, you know, they don't have any kind of restrictions where they think, oh, maybe let's have it in English, for example, for the English speaker to comprehend. No, they'd have just translators, you know, come up with the subtitles on the bottom and they're good with that. Um, they are very keen on ensuring that the identity is kept. They want that in there. They want the Arab identity to be shown, whether it's the Egyptian, Saudi, Palestinian, Lebanese, they want it out there. Now you uh, uh, profiled Naila El Khadja. Um, she said she got into it because she was determined to break through this uh, status quo of being a male dominated industry. You uh, identified uh, six that were uh, prominently displayed in the story that you wrote. Well, I spoke to Haifa Mansour a couple of months ago where I met her and I met her at the Inter Red Sea International Film Festival. It was that it was the first inaugural event of the of Saudi Arabia's uh, film festival. Um, and I had a very nice sit down actually with her. She's been in the film scene for over 10 years, 10, 15 years now. And um, she she did mention that the struggles as a Saudi female director producer at the time, but that was then. 
nowadays she's very she's very much free to do whatever she wants and however she wants it very putting putting in mind a lot of the cultural appropriation but you know she doesn't have that restriction anymore but this is one case you have Marianne Hori, for example, she's an Egyptian filmmaker. She's been in the scene since the 1980s. Her uncle, her maternal uncle is Yusuf Shaheen. She knows the ropes. She's been in there. She's been on, behind the cameras, but in the scene for over 35 years now. You have Farah Nabutsi, who's also been in the, in the scene for a couple of years now. Nadine Lepke, actress turned uh, director, producer. That's got to give. All these women are out there and they've been in the scene for more than 10, 15 years now. So just because it's not mentioned in the news, just because you don't look at us and you have a microscope on us does not mean that they're not out there. And yes, there are challenges as it is with everyone, with every female filmmaker in the world. It's not a, it's not a problem that's just you know, isolated here in the region. It's a global problem. I mean, look at the numbers. We just said 8% in the US, 26% here in the Arab world. That's a lot. That's a huge, huge comparison. And I'm sure that even if we do more studies, if we looked into the southeastern region of Asia, excuse me, Southeast Asia, you'd have a lesser number than that. So wow. it's a global problem. And I, I don't, I disagree with the term, you know, going against the status quo. I believe that we have the opportunities. We have the platforms. There's been a lot of backlash in Hollywood for not including women of color, women of different race. I think now that the topic has been addressed on several occasions, I think it's now, it's, they have to include women. They have to look into their films because, but at, the end of the, but at the same time, do you need to add these films into these categories because of their race or color? How about the quality of the films? You know, you need to put into consideration the quality of the films. And uh, you wrote uh, and observed something that I thought was really interesting, too. You noted that the Saudi film industry is still in its infancy. Tell us a little bit about that. You mentioned earlier that they had a film festival, Saudi film festival. Tell yeah. us, give us a little uh, sense of the Saudi film industry, where it is today and where it's moving. Well, we, we, I, it, the reason why it's a, it's a very young and very... Uh, it's a it's a startup industry. It's because we never had films. We never had Saudi films. The only Saudi content we had on TV are either talk shows or comedy shows. Um, they'd have would have, of course, um, pr um, what do they call them? Um, prize shows? Or, wait, they're called prize shows. Prize right. Shows? They get the uh, uh, yeah, um, contestants. Game shows. Contestants game, and game shows. shows. Yes. Yeah, yeah, game shows. Game shows. So we only had a lot of see, we had a lot of that. Of course, news and whatnot. But with time, we noticed that there is an appetite. There's a growing appetite. And I think one of the very first films, of course, there was Wajda by Hal al Mansour. There was also a film called Baraka Yuqabil Baraka, Baraka Meets Baraka. It's the name of two of the two um, main actress, actors in, in this film by uh, in 2016. It was um, it appeared at the Berlin Film Festival, if I'm not if I'm not mistaken. But a couple of years ago, the, film, the Ministry of Culture uh, launched or established the Film Commission. And they were, they were basically calling on all Saudi filmmakers out there to, instead of going outside or uh, across borders to create their films, to, you know what, show us what you got. Um, and I think they've been providing a lot of different, a lot of different programs, incentives, financial incentives, funds as well, because for a, fa for a filmmaker or an independent filmmaker, the most important thing is funding. And I think they do also provide that. So that was then. And I think there were a couple of smaller competitions just to basically get the, get the ball rolling. And then, you know, COVID hit in 2020, unfortunately. Um, at the time, there was the beginning of, it was just a small spark, you know. It, it would, there, was a, there, were, there was talk about an international film festival here in my city, in town, uh, in my city, Jeddah. It was called the Red Sea Film Festival. And of course, unfortunately, COVID hit and uh, they had to postpone it. But it was going to be the major internet, a major international film festival right here in, Sa in Jeddah, in Saudi Arabia. So they inaugurated last year in uh, December. Uh, it was a 10 day event. It was in the heart of the city, old downtown. So you can imagine like a huge, huge, huge theater. And you're surrounded by 400 year old buildings that go back, wow. you know, to and, and families. You can see the families on their on the houses. You can see people just, you know, walking around. And you know, there's it's amazing how you can mix 
history with modern times. We're talking about films here, and we're talking, and then you're walking on the footsteps and of, of you know years past, you know peoples of people of other generations of past generations. Um, I think over 130 films were showcased there, by the way, and over wow. 30 films were made by Saudi by excuse me by female filmmakers. I know that the film industry at growing up in America fueled many of the stereotypes that we know about Arabs. Um, they define political understandings about the Middle East through movies, uh, which is why there were so many anti-Arab movies that portrayed us terribly. But I, once you get into the film industry, you realize that film has the power to present a positive image too. And to counter that stereotype, when we're not a part of it, we can become the victims. It's it's encouraging to see, you know, not just uh, women uh, from the Middle East, but the voices correct of Arab women are growing and breaking through that to assert themselves. There's nothing stopping them, right? Agreed. Agreed. There's nothing stopping us. And I don't think, I think the one thing that I'd have to say is there isn't a lot of competition here. I mean, women don't look at, at their arts as com uh, as competition they're doing their thing the men are doing their thing and they're just out there there's a lot of really good vibes between them you know there's no um, there's no bad competition i mean it's a healthy kind of competition that just and there's a lot of support by the way films enlighten whether it's Amer an american film or an arab or a saudi film films are amazing and we all we're all huge fans of films but I think the one thing I'd like to say is, you know, we need to support independent filmmakers, whether they're Arab, uh, female or male, uh, more female, please. Uh, we need them more out there. Um, and I think they have a lot to tell. And and just one other point too, I guess, uh, just because it's a woman making a film doesn't mean that she's different from the male counterparts. There, There's no gender distinction between the no. women and the men making these films. Uh, those uh, women that you uh, mentioned in your story probably have some really good films that have nothing to do with uh, whether they're women or men or what exactly. their gender is. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that's the whole point. Exactly. And that's the whole point. We can't judge a film by the filmmaker. We judge a film by its content, by how it's produced, by the quality. How you need, we need to understand that these are strong films out there. They're really, really strong. And the message is, is very clear. So that should be the way that should be that should be the only way we judge a film. My guest, one of my favorite guests, actually, Rowan Redwan. She's always so generous in terms of her time and uh, to uh, accommodate the radio show to join us. Uh, it was really Thank a pleasure you. speaking with you again, Rowan. Thank you, Ray. It's a pleasure You're being welcome. here. And now I'd like to introduce our guest, filmmaker Dania El Hamrani. Uh, she's the CCO of Ag Dancer Productions an independent film and television production company based in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, which was established in 2006. Danya works with Dania Nassif, two dynamic filmmaking professional Saudi women who head the company. Collectively, they have spent over 10 years in the filmmaking and media industry and gained experience in the different areas of television, documentary, and corporate production. So I'm on with filmmaker Danya El Hamrani, CCO of Egg Dancer Productions, an independent film and television production company based in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. It was established in 2006. Danya, thank you so much for joining us on our radio show today. So tell me a little bit about what does Egg Dancer Productions do? What, what's your goal and, and what, what kind of films do you make? Our focus is in documentary film. And we like to do stories uh, with the social issues slant. Our goal is basically to bring the stories of, you know, our local stories here in Saudi Arabia, to tell stories that are by us and for us, but also to bring our stories to the world. So, and, and that's usually what I tell writers when they ask me, how do I become a writer? I say, start out by telling your story. Isn't that the best way for people to get into writing and uh, filmmaking to tell your story? It definitely is. It definitely is. I think for so long, we've had people tell our stories for us and they 
are being told from the perspective of somebody who has not walked in our shoes and so therefore can't tell our stories authentically. And so this is something that we're really uh, striving to do is to tell our own stories and our own voice. Now, for a lot of uh, people in America who are going to be watching this, they're going to be saying, wow, a woman actually leading in an industry in Saudi Arabia. Um, there's still that stereotype out there. What, what's the reality for women, uh, first off, in general, and then in the film industry? Well, um, so my partner, whose name is also Dania, her name is Dania Masif, and I started at Dancer Productions in 2006. So we've been doing this for a long time. It's nothing new. Um, and in fact, uh, our first long format documentary is called Rise, uh, The Journey of Women in Saudi Arabia. And it's about the history of uh, women in Saudi Arabia starting in the 1950s when um, uh, education was for women uh, was uh, first started and schools were first open and how that changed their trajectory. And so our film is full of uh, female pioneers in different industries from sports to art to media and in business and uh, even in uh, law and um, politics, let's say. So I think the stereotype that is very common uh, about Saudi women is that we are uh, oppressed but that's why it was so important for us to make this film rise was because it actually shows the different side in the history of Saudi women who have been working in all these different industries and pushing boundaries uh, for a very long time. And, and I guess that, that's the important thing to say. And again, it's not just a stereotype of Saudi Arabia. Uh, people have this stereotype of every other country except their own. And as we know, Women in America also have faced a struggle and challenges. So this idea that somehow you're different um, is really kind of a false stereotype. But what's interesting is that you get to tell your story. Is it possible for the public to see that uh, documentary that you produced about women in Saudi Arabia? Uh, I really hope so. We're still looking for distribution, to be honest. So maybe if someone wants to pick it up, I hope that people will get to see it. And is that your first production or have you done several? Well, that was our first long format, but since then uh, we've done others. So we've done uh, stories about fatherhood in the Arab world. Uh, we are now working on a feature documentary about uh, uh, Saudis with um, uh, intellectual disabilities and their experience and the experience of their family um, within, uh, let's say, contemporary situations in Saudi Arabia. So we have been working for a very long time, but I think Rise was our first long format film that we did that was a documentary. Well, I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed because I, I'm excited for you and I hope it gets out there and does get picked up so the public can see it. Now, I know it's a challenge, at least for many years. First, it was a challenge for Arabs in general to get into movie production, Hollywood, and competition. Then some Arabs, especially in Egypt, started acting more. There were more Egyptian actors. And then the rest of the Arab world seemed to follow, too. What's it like for a woman to be in the film uh, production industry? Mm, well, uh, like you said, like when we started in 2006, it was a very nascent industry. So it didn't matter about gender or anything like that. It was just very new and there were very few people that were doing it. And so we've been doing it for a very long time. Uh, and uh, I don't think that gender played a part for us. If anything, we were, I think, lucky because uh, being a very conservative society, um, we as women could go almost into any place uh, where men were, but men couldn't go in where the women were. So we were very lucky because we could go into the women and we could go into the men. Uh, and that way we were able to hear more stories and, uh, you know, kind of uh, tell those stories. Um, now things have changed a lot. And so a lot of people are going into the film industry, both men and women. And uh, I think, I don't want to say there's more women, but there are a lot of women because um, 
in Jeddah, we have a university called the Athlet University, and they are teaching film studies there. And that for a long time, I think now it's become co-ed if I'm not mistaken, but for a long time, Athlet University was only for women. So there were many women locally that were getting trained in filmmaking. And so now we're seeing this boom of female filmmakers. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, it seems like everyone's a filmmaker these days. I think it's phenomenal. And, I, and we were talking with Rowan Redwan, one of the editors at Arab News, who's a big fan of yours, by the way. She speaks very highly of you. Um, she spoke and she addressed the issue too. And she pointed out that, yes, there are more women getting involved in uh, movie production and film. But when you look at it, the products are irrespective of gender. So it's the quality of the products. doesn't matter whether it's a woman or a male. Um, but she did note that there are more women today um, getting into this field. Why do you think that is? Because some people think women are better storytellers than men. I don't know if they're better or not better, but uh, what I definitely do know is that for now, at least, I mean, filmmaking is a very tough industry and it's, um, you're not going to get rich off of it. You know, at least for us as documentarians, we're definitely not, <laughs> not rich anytime soon. Um, and I think because we still, even though we are now have become two income families in Saudi, but we still have also that, um, uh, let's say gender roles are still pretty defined and uh, men are still the primary breadwinners in their family. So I think in most families, not all. And so I think that that gives women um, a lot more freedom to explore things they would probably be passionate about doing, like telling stories or making films, because they don't have the pressure of being the primary breadwinner for the family. So that's a possibility. I mean, uh, and again, opportunities. So like I said, because Eflat University is teaching filmmaking, um, young female filmmakers have uh, more of an opportunity to study it locally rather than traveling abroad, which makes it also <clears throat> financially more viable for a lot of people to be able to go into it. So maybe those are some of the reasons why women are going into it more. I know when I got into writing, um, it was a shock for my family. We're Middle Eastern, my par both parents from Jerusalem and uh, Bethlehem. And uh, all my cousins and my uncles are doctors and engineers. The ones that didn't get to be doctors and engineers became grocery store owners. Um, when they found out that I was going to be a journalist, it was almost like a shame because they viewed it as like, what are you doing with your life? They didn't see it as a life path. Has that changed for you? You're obviously a much younger generation than mine, but is it a challenge to convince our traditions that what we do to tell stories is so important? I don't think I'm that much younger of a generation than you are. Um, so in my generation, it definitely was difficult. Um, I had a lot of pushback and people would not identify it as a career, you know? And even when my partner and I would go, you know, Dan and Asif, my business partner and I would go <clears throat> sometimes to do uh, development meetings you know, we would be asked, oh, you know, is this your hobby? And we'd be like, no, we've been doing this professionally for years, you know? So I definitely think that with an older generation, um, mine and above, is uh, that was something that we had to struggle for, for sure. But with the younger generation, I mean, things have changed so drastically. And with the YouTube revolution, I think so many more people have gone into industry of content creating, you know, um, whether, whether it's for social media or film. So I think there has definitely been a shift in perception um, for sure among the younger generation about what, you know, constitutes a career. And your goals, I mean, in terms of, I'm assuming, but maybe I'm wrong, that one of the goals is to have a big two hour spectacular big screen film, you know, competing at the Academy Awards. 
and and for an Oscar. Is that is that like part of it or is it bigger or different? Well, for me, I don't think that's one of my goals because um, uh, with documentary, even if we're doing long format, I think it's very rare unless you're a specific kind of documentary uh, to be like on in the in movie theaters on the big screen. I mean, who doesn't want to win an Oscar? Of course, that's every filmmaker's dream. But I think our bigger goal is definitely just finding these stories and telling these stories. And for me as a filmmaker, experiencing these stories, because what's really exciting for me is that I get to be part of my characters' lives and their experiences and share in their intimate moments. So for example, we're working on a documentary right now about adults with uh, intellectual disabilities and we're filming it over the period of a year. And now we're about nine months into the filming process and we're sharing birthdays and um, driving lessons and uh, all of these different experiences with our characters. You know, they become part of our lives and us as a part of their lives. And that is such an amazing experience for me that, yes, at the end of the day, I want my film to be complete and I want people to watch it, to feel a little bit of what we have felt during the process of creating, you know, uh, the film. But just the journey is enough for me because it's a great opportunity to experience other people's lives. And I've kind of felt that throughout my whole filmmaking experiences, making documentaries, is that I get to see behind the scenes, behind the curtain, you know, we get to go into people's homes behind closed doors and meet the families. And that's why I love documentary. I think if, with fiction, it's a very different experience. You know, you have actors and lights and setups and things that you have to wait forever for. But with documentary, you're working, or for at least for us in the projects we've worked on, we're working in really small crews. We work with people that we love to work with, we love to hang out with, we love to spend time with. And we get to experience people's lives. And that is such a blessing and such a gift. And that part is enough for me. So even if my film never wins an Oscar, never gets on the big screen, at least I'm going through the process of making the film, which is in itself amazing. It, it sounds like a documentary is more fulfilling also to the producer, the filmmaker. For me, it is. I don't know about other people. Maybe other people prefer doing fiction, but I've been approached to direct a lot of different fiction projects, and I can't say I'm 100% against it, but my passion and my heart is in documentaries. So just the thought, when I'm on a fiction set, I just don't have that drive and that passion. When I'm doing my documentary, I just, I, I'm full of life. One final question then, uh, and just for our listeners again, we're talking with Danya El Hamrani. She's the CCO of Egg Dancer Productions, an independent film and television production company based in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Um, and by the way, their website is eggdancer.com. Danya, I love that name, Egg Dancer. It's very creative. If you had some advice for women out there who want to get into filmmaking and the film industry, what would you tell them? I would say um, just do it. I know it's so cliche, but um, I think you learn by doing more than anything else. If you can find somebody that you admire, you look up to, who's already in the industry, uh, who can help mentor you, who you can learn from, who you can work with, you know. I mean, I, I started carrying Apple boxes. That's how I started out in my career. So I think like, if you can be with somebody and work from the ground up, that would be my advice. All right. I want listen, Danya. It's so you would be your role model that they should be looking up to. And thank I want you. to thank you for taking the time to do this interview and sharing some of your thoughts with our audience out there in Detroit, Washington, D.C. and Chicago. Danya El Hamrani, guest filmmaker, CCO of Ed. Egg Dancer Productions, an independent film and television production company based in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. It was established in 2006. Their website is eggdancer.com. Danya, thank you so much for doing this. Thank I really you. appreciate it. It was very thank enjoyable. So We're going to take a quick break here at the Ray Hanania Radio Show uh, for some ads. And when we come back, we will speak with Charles Lister, Senior Fellow and the Director of the Syria Encountering Terrorism 
and extremism programs at the Middle East Institute, who's going to give us some insight into what's happening in Syria. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Life is a nonprofit charity that's provided humanitarian aid and development to people and communities for over 25 years, regardless of race, color, religion, or cultural background. When disaster occurs here or around the world, Life for Relief and Development rushes in to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. Please help improve these efforts. Make your tax-deductible donation to Life now at lifeusa.org or call 248-424-7493. Imagine you're on a train track, somewhere miles away, a train is headed your way. You can't see it yet, but it's coming, slowly but surely. If you have prediabetes or you're at risk for type 2 diabetes, you may be on the wrong track, and diabetes could be heading your way. Bit by bit, the danger is getting closer and closer. So should you stay on the track you're on now or move to make a change and reduce your risk? If you have prediabetes or you're at risk for type 2 diabetes, you may qualify for the National Diabetes Prevention Program in your local community. This one-year program could be the ongoing support you need to put you on the right track. Not only did participants lose weight, they cut their risk of type 2 diabetes in half. Ready to get on board for a healthier future? Learn more about the National Diabetes Prevention Program and what else you can do to manage and prevent diabetes at michigan.gov slash diabetes. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I'm on with Charles Lister, a senior fellow and the director of the Syria and Countering Terrorism and Extremism Programs at the Middle East Institute. Prior to joining the Middle East Institute, Lister was a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institution in Qatar and a senior consultant to the multinationally backed Syria Track 2 Dialogue Initiative in which he managed nearly three years of intensive face-to-face -face engagement with the leadership of over 100 Syrian armed opposition groups. Uh, Mr. Lister, thank you so much for joining us on our radio show here today. Sure, thank you very much for having me. So Syria is just some little short news story for most Americans. When they open the paper, there's a little blurb about it. Is Syria a little blurb? I mean, how do you describe the conflict that's going on in Syria? Is it a war? Is it a skirmish? Is it political pressure points? How would you describe it? So it's a key question. I mean, first of all, sadly, Syria has become uh, a sort of an afterthought for, for most of us. Um, but I don't think that is really a, sort of an accurate depiction of the real story and what's still going on. Um, first of all, should go without saying that the Syria's crisis uh, is a long way from over. Um, there are multiple conflicts going on within the country, not just one. Um, and all of the root causes that gave way to the uprising and the crisis in 2011, all those root causes are still there today. Most of those root causes, in fact, are worse today than they were in 2011. So I think in terms of context, that's important. How would I describe it? I think, uh, you know, over the years, um, serious crisis sort of deteriorated and escalated to such an extent and also became so complicated that it that various international actors have intervened in pursuit of their own interests over the years. And I think as a result, really, Syria is best described now as a geopolitical conflict. There are the Turks, there are the Iranians, the Russians, of course, the Syrian government, the Israelis. Um, the global coalition against ISIS. Within that, there are all a whole variety of different terrorist organizations, as well as the opposition, uh, the Kurds, the SDF, who have backed uh, uh, and been our partners in the fight against ISIS. It is an incredibly complicated uh, crisis. But at, at core, it's a crisis. Uh, and there's lots of layers to that. Yeah, it seems that uh, just there's on and off violence that we hear about. And recently, there was over the last few weeks, there was a, a number of incidents involving the Israelis, I believe, attacking Iranian interests, the United States attacking uh, uh, ISIS interests uh, in response to attacks that uh, were uh, targeting American troops. 
Um, is that is this been typical or has there been a uh, increase, do you think, in the violence? Or is this what we've seen on and off, kind of like a roller coaster of up and down uh, activity? Well, I think it, it depends really, uh, you know, not to go sort of too deep into the weeds, but it depends which of the conflict within Syria you're looking at. So, of course, the, the confrontation between ISIS and Syrians and between the international community and ISIS has been going on since at least 2014, uh, if not earlier than that. Uh, and so if we're asking the question as to whether or not confrontation between US troops and our local partners, who we call the Syrian Democratic Forces, and ISIS is new, no, that's been going on for eight plus years. Uh, the Israeli government, for example, has also been carrying out uh, periodic airstrikes against uh, Iran and its attempts to um, ship in what they call strategic weapon systems onto Syrian soil uh, for use against Israel, whether in Lebanon, in Syria or in Palestine. Um, and the Israelis have been doing that for years. Um, in the last two or three years, they've probably conducted at least 200 uh, different uh, sets of airstrikes on Syrian territory. So that's also relatively new, you know, one, uh, sorry, not relatively new. Um, you know, another element of, of ongoing conflict is in the northwest of the country, um, where there is still a wide spectrum of opposition groups uh, in place. And the Syrian government, backed by the Russians, continue to bomb and shell northwestern Syria, where there are more than 3 million displaced civilians, most of them, most of them living in camps and tents. Uh, so that continues in the southwest of the country, which used to be controlled by the opposition, um, but several years ago was you know, forced to surrender to the regime uh, in what the regime called a reconciliation deal. Uh, that, that reconciliation has completely failed. Uh, and so there is a bubbling com uh, conflict going on there where there is uh, murders and assassinations on an almost daily basis uh, between the regime and former opposition elements. So no matter where in the country you look, there is ongoing conflict between different actors. And all of that has been long running for, for years now. And as you describe it, yes, there are flare ups, um, as we saw between the US and Iran in eastern Syria just last week. Um, and that is something that, as you, I think, described, bubbles up and bubbles down over time. Yeah, and who is the, if you had to pick one uh, force or influencer in this uh, uh, mix in Syria, who's holding the electrical cord that can pull the plug out, turn the lights out, or I guess maybe the switch? Who can turn this on and off? Is there one player or is it several players? Uh, I think if there was one player, we would probably have seen Syria's crisis resolved one way or another. We'd have seen it resolved through a victory on one side or the other or some kind of negotiated settlement. Uh, in reality, there is no player who holds all of the cards. And that's precisely why more than 11 years later, this crisis is still going on and why all of those root causes that I described earlier haven't been resolved. Um, ultimately, I think the Russians, uh, you know, have probably changed the dynamic and balance in Syria the most um, of everyone. When they intervened in September 2015, the regime was on the verge, uh, on the verge of collapse uh, and implosion. And the Russians unquestionably reversed that and put the regime back into a position of advantage. But they have uh, clearly failed to, quote unquote, win the conflict uh, in the years that have followed. Um, and that's why we're in this kind of geopolitical stalemate. You know, the United States with their local partners control roughly 30% of the country in the Northeast and the East. Uh, Turkey is de facto occupying alongside its opposition partners, uh, about nine to 12% of the North of the country in the Northwest. And then the regime controls about 60% uh, along the sort of central spine and the, and the west of the country. So the, the, the Syria is literally divided. You can draw lines along the map, uh, and they're very clear lines. They're not blurry uh, anymore. But those lines have been frozen now for several years. There really is no movement in terms of resolving that division or partition, frankly, of the country. Is uh, And I know the Russians haven't, haven't been very good at winning wars, as we've seen in Ukraine, which is going on way beyond the few days that they had said that it would take 
um, this war in Syria also, um, they don't seem to be doing well. Is their goal just to hold on to that 60% for Assad? Um, and, you, it, and are they using it as leverage in any way? For example, is Iran using their presence in Syria as leverage, for example, to influence the Vienna talks on the JCPOA? So all good questions. I would say, you know, from from a from a in a kind of objective uh, from an objective position, uh, actually the Russians have have achieved a fair bit of success in Syria, but uh, with relatively little uh, sort of military investment. And there's a reason for that. When they intervened in 2015, we as the international community backed off, watched it happen, did nothing to stop it or to challenge it. In fact, we kind of rolled over and allowed the Russians to do things, including to defeat our own partners who we'd been providing support to for years, we actually forced our partners to surrender to Russia and the regime. Everything has changed with Ukraine. This is really the first time that the world has decided to stand up against the Russians. And now we see the effect of that. They have kind of comprehensively failed so far in Ukraine and we've made Russia suffer for it. Uh, and it's, it's kind of sad, frankly, that we didn't choose to do that in Syria. The challenge in Syria would have been much easier than what we see in Ukraine, but you know, history is is history. Um, the Russians unquestionably are, I think, content where they are, but they'd like to be doing more. Of course, they want the regime to retake 100% of the country, but I think they realize that so long as the Turks are uh, helping to sort of occupy parts of the North and the Northwest, and so long as US troops are in the Northeast and the East, that's not going to happen. Uh, and in that position, I think they're content that the sort of status quo they find themselves in is, is good enough. What we've seen going back further in history is that Russia has also been quite happy with, I guess, what we could call messy or chaotic victories. Look at Chechnya. Uh, for years, it was riddled with insurgency and terrorism. But from a Russian perspective, that was OK. That was sufficient. Um, they had quelled what was deemed to be a far more significant threat. Uh, and the fact that it looked chaotic after that for a long time was all right. I think that's really where we are in Syria. Um, Iran, on a whole different whole different story, uh, Iran is not calling all of the shots in Syria, but they, uh, ever since the 1979 revolution, have sought to sort of establish this channel of influence from Tehran all the way to the Mediterranean uh, through to Israel-Palestine. And that's unquestionably what they have managed to achieve. Um, and in Syria, that is arguably the most strategic kind of jewel in the crown uh, for that Iranian regional strategy. Uh, and that's precisely why we see Israel conducting uh, this quite a significant um, series of airstrikes over recent years, targeting anything from ballistic missiles, precision guidance technology, um, and, and or air defense systems that Iran has flown in, often using its state aircraft carriers, uh, into Damascus International Airport. And then they have sought to sort of truck those across the border into Lebanon uh, or station them in Syria, pointed directly at Israel. Um, so for Iran, it's, it's absolutely of enormous significance. And it, they've arguably achieved what they needed to. Now, this is going to sound strange, but is the conflict in Syria a buffer um, where um, Iran, other players, the Russians, the Israelis, the U.S. can actually fight in a uh, restricted way with their opponents um, and not engage into all-out war. In other words, does this take away from the tensions in other areas? We focus on this area as opposed to the idea that, you know, maybe uh, Israel might strike Iran, its nuclear uh, operations there. Uh, maybe the U.S. might find itself going into another conflict. Does this kind of concentrate the focus to prevent it from spreading? Or do you think in the long term, if this isn't resolved, maybe this conflict could grow and spread regionally? I think I think that's a really interesting question. I think uh, uh, undoubtedly over recent years, Syria has become the kind of focal point for a lot of these regional and geopolitical hostilities. Uh, and I suppose to an extent, the fact that Syria was already an awful uh, crisis uh, within which there are multiple wars and conflicts going on, uh, I suppose to an extent that could have sort of distracted attention or distracted the potential for a wider conflict in the region. Um, but, uh, but fundamentally speaking, the spark has always been there or the kindling has always been there to see 
conflict or conflict in Syria becomes something much bigger and much more regional. Um, and so, you know, if you look at the sort of Israeli-Iranian dynamic, uh, if Iran was to develop nuclear weapons, Syria would swiftly become almost irrelevant uh, from an Israeli national security perspective. Um, if uh, ISIS uh, sort of dramatically re-emerged in the way that it did back in 2014, we would no longer be talking about the Syrian regime and the opposition. It would be back to attention to ISIS, which, by the way, ISIS was a symptom of Syria's crisis, not a cause. So we did very well in treating a symptom, but we did nothing to ameliorate those root causes that allowed ISIS to emerge in the first place. Um, so that, that for me, as a Syria analyst, but also as someone who also wears another hat as a counterterrorism analyst, that's why Syria, I think, is so problematic, is you've got all these ingredients bubbling away under the surface that can allow not just conflict to sustain itself within Syria's boundaries, but has all of the potential to become a much bigger geopolitical or an international flashpoint, as it did earlier on in Syria's crisis. Uh, and, you know, talking about root causes, the biggest one here still is the Syrian regime. Um, as international prosecutors have made clear in recent years, we as the international community have more evidence of war crimes and crimes against humanity conducted by the Syrian regime than the world did against Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party at the Nuremberg trials. That, wow. it, the, the scale of crime in Syria in the last 11 years is so enormous and we have so much evidence um, that so long as that regime remains in place, all those root causes that could give way to any number of things, conflict between governments, terrorism, international crime, uh, organized crime, and all these other things are all ultimately rooted still in the regime's uh, survival. Um, and not to, to go on for forever, but your viewers might also be interested to know sure. that uh, as a result of the crisis in Syria and the fact that it has sustained for so long, the Syrian regime has now become a narco state of global significance. Wow. Uh, an issue that is almost never reaches our TV screens or our newspapers. But last year in 2021, um, the Syrian regime in a series of factories uh, across the country uh, run mostly by the fourth mechanized division, which is run by Bashar al-Assad's brother, Maher, um, exported roughly $30 billion of methamphetamine called captagon, uh, mostly around the Middle East, $30 billion. Now to put that number into perspective here, the legal exports of Syria that same year in 2021 was $800 million. Wow. So the drug industry, uh, an illegal drug run by the regime now is literally the only element of importance of the Syrian economy. This is a narco state in the heart of the Middle East, exporting drugs mostly to the Gulf. Um, and that has an enormous significance for regional stability. And the Europeans are beginning to get worried about that reaching their shores. Uh, and several ports in Africa have seized Syria made captagon over the last couple of years. So there's a lot of elements here that I think most people are not as aware of as they perhaps should be. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, for our listeners, we're talking with Charles Lister, a senior fellow and the director of the Syria Encountering Terrorism and Extremism Programs at the Middle East Institute. Just a couple more questions, uh, Mr. Lister. And, and again, I appreciate your insights. Uh, the narco terrorism, the drug aspect, I think is one that's been completely eclipsed in this conflict, but it sounds so uh, imper perilous. You know, but, and you were saying that it's uh, the product is focused mainly in distribution to the Middle East with mm -hmm. concerns in Europe and other countries. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So Captagon is, is known as the poor man's cocaine. Um, and so it's relatively affordable in comparison to other hard drugs. Um, but yeah, the primary market for now is the Gulf. Um, it's being shipped in shipping containers, often through secondary and tertiary uh, destinations through Turkey, through Italian ports, through Greek ports. It's been seized in Sudan, in Malaysia, uh, in Singapore. Um, but ultimately, most of that is, attempt is a distraction. The ultimate destination for now is mostly the Gulf and particularly Saudi Arabia. I know that uh, uh, pr uh, former President uh, Donald Trump had said that he wanted to withdraw American troops out of Syria. Now, 
it wasn't a significant number of soldiers there like it was in Afghanistan, obviously. Um, but since then, what's what's happened with uh, the U.S. approach towards Syria? I mean, what's our end game? Do we have one? Has President Biden defined what he'd like to see and is he acting on it? Um, or are we just kind of riding this, uh, uh, you know, reckless train that's uh, just moving slowly but steadily through uh, time? Yeah, so, I mean, that's that's probably the key question these days. I mean, ultimately, the U.S., alongside many of its allies and partners in Europe and in the Middle East, have had a fairly consistent um, objective in terms of Syria policy writ large. So not just talking about troops but and ISIS, but writ large, the policy still is aimed at facilitating uh, the conditions or creating the conditions necessary to see a political resolution to the conflict, a negotiation between the various different actors, including the regime or the government, um, that allow Syria to move on. Now, right now, that seems like a long way away in the distance. Um, but quite frankly, we also know from allowing Syria or leaving Syria to deteriorate that, this, that the, the consequences of that have been catastrophic. You know, in earlier years of the crisis, we didn't do enough to contain the crisis in Syria. And what did we get? An enormous refugee crisis in Europe, which unquestionably catalyzed Brexit, uh, the UK's departure from the EU, uh, major other divisions within the European Union. Um, the rise of far-right populism unquestionably has its root in that refugee crisis too, as well as the explosion of ISIS. As I say, in the, in the region, Iran's uh, sort of uh, achievement of its ultimate regional agenda and the resumption of conflict between Israel and Iran. Um, big divisions within the Gulf had their roots in the Syrian crisis too. So no matter where you look, the Syrian crisis has been really, really consequential for, for the world. Um, and so even though that agenda, that objective of seeing a political resolution seems so far away, it is still precisely so important because of how damaging Syria's crisis has been and can still be uh, to international stability. Um, so for that reason, we continue to engage diplomatically. We have a wide set of financial and economic sanctions on the Syrian regime and its ability, specifically on its ability to conduct war against its own people. Um, and we have 900 soldiers deployed in eastern Syria to continue the fight against ISIS, which is very much a fight that continues. Um, and we are standing by that policy and Donald Trump's desire to withdraw was not backed up by any form of logic. It was an emotional decision, um, which quite frankly, the rest of his administration and the wider US government fundamentally opposed just precisely because of how illogical it was. Um, and we don't put a timeline on how long our troops are gonna be there because that only gives an advantage to our many adversaries. Um, but we are sticking with this policy in the hope that eventually we will be able to facilitate a political resolution that gives Syria at least a better chance um, of moving forward. Yeah, Mr. Lister, it was really a pleasure and very insightful to speak with you. I really do appreciate you joining our radio show to help remind people that, you know, we see the headlines, but I don't think they appreciate what's actually going on. And I think you really did help to explain it. Um, my guest, Charles Lister, Senior Fellow and Director of the Syria Encountering terrorism and extremism programs at the Middle East Institute. Um, I believe the website, if the people want to look up more information, is mei.edu. Um, yes, that's and, right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lister. A, again, it was a pleasure to have you on the program. Absolutely. Thank you. It's been my pleasure, too. Thank you for listening to our program today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. We had some interesting discussions. Please join me again next week on Wednesday when we broadcast live again from Detroit and Washington, D.C. on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. and in Chicago on Thursdays at 12 noon. You have a great week. We will talk to you again. Bye-bye, everybody.